So uh, welcome to the Smart Grid Seminar. Our speaker today is Professor Alejandro Domingos Garcia from the University of Illinois at Luna Champaign. Uh, he's going to talk about data-driven control of distributed energy resources. Uh, just a reminder, uh, our next uh, seminar is next week at the same time. Uh, the speaker is going to talk about cybersecurity. Uh, professor Alejandro Domingos Garcia is a professor in the DC department at UIUC. Uh, where he is affiliated with the power and energy systems area. He's also a research professor in the Coordinated Science Lab and Information Trust Institute. He has been a, a Granger associate since 2011 and a, and a William Everett scholar since 2017. His research programs include control of distributed energy resources, grid data analytics, and uncertainty analysis in electrical energy systems. Uh, he received a degree of industrial engineering from the University of Oviedo in 2001, this is in Spain, and the PhD degree in WE and ECS from MIT in 2007. Uh, so he received the NSF Career Award in 2010 and the Young Engineer Award from uh, NSF Career Award. Uh, the IEEE Power and Energy Society and He is currently an editor of the IEEE Transactions on Power Systems and IEEE Power Engineering Letters. So with that, I will stop sharing my screens and let the speakers start the presentation. Thank you very much uh, for coming in today. It's been a uh, two years since last time I gave a talk at a public venue like this, so very happy to be here. Two, two years to this day, actually. It was March 5th, the last time I was out there in the world. Anyway, okay, so uh, I would like to start the presentation by giving you some uh, uh, background on why the problems I'm gonna be talking about are important. And uh, I'm gonna start with this chart where you can basically see the breakdown in terms of the um, primary sources of energy for electricity generation in the United States. And uh, you see that about 65% uh, of the electricity generated in the United States is uh, done using uh, fossil fuels, about which 35% uh, is uh, uh, natural gas, uh, 27 coal, and 1% uh, uh, oil and other things, okay? So that's uh, pretty high. So if you look at uh, this other chart uh, about the contribution of the electricity sector to greenhouse uh, gas uh, emissions, about 28% of it just in the United States comes from electricity generation, just uh, trailing uh, transportation sector. And um, you know, worldwide it's about 42% uh, the total, the total uh, emissions from electricity generation in, uh, and so on. So, we need to address this, and uh, the way to address this is um, by by basically utilizing a renewable-based power generation. Uh, okay, so so that's what uh, th that's fine. That's a, that's a great uh, solution. But uh, renewable-based generation also comes with uh, its own uh, challenges. Uh, so, for example, a deep penetration of renewable-based generation uh, might cause uh, trouble. Um, in bulk power systems in terms of uh, uh, frequency regulation. And in distribution systems, you might have issues of uh, voltage uh, control, okay? So typically frequency regulation at the bulk level is done using uh, uh, large uh, synchronous generators, okay? But if those are being displaced uh, because of renewable based uh, generation, so that's a, that's a problem, right? So. On the other hand, uh, there are some these, uh, resources at the distribution level that uh, you could utilize for that uh, task. Uh, in terms of voltage uh, control uh, on distribution uh, networks, uh, typically that's done using uh, LTCs and uh, uh, switch uh, capacitors. Um, but the problem with those devices, which are uh, mechanical uh, in nature, is that uh, they are not uh, designed to withstand the variability of uh, of uh, renewable based generation. Okay, so you have all these uh, issues. So those are some challenges uh, introduced by the integration of renewables. So how can we uh, address uh, those? 
So one potential solution is the number of uh, disciplinary resources that are being integrated the, at the distribution level. Those typically come with uh, inverters. And that's how you interface them with the with the grid. And uh, you could uh, potentially utilize those resources to provide uh, ancillary services to the grid. Okay, so that frequency regulation that I was talking about that could be done if you were to coordinate these resources uh, appropriately. Uh, you could also use them to operate portions of a distribution and network in islanded operation in case there is a blackout, you know, the notion of micro lead and, and so on. Okay. So a lot of opportunities uh, in this space if you start utilizing uh, the ERs. So the issue that the with the utilization of the uh, ERs is that uh, let me see what's going on with the clicker. It died on me, the battery. Oh, okay. Okay. So the, the issue with utilizing uh, the ERs is that uh, you need to develop uh, appropriate uh, control schemes for the utilization, right? And uh, that's something that uh, we have not uh, done in the past. I mean, these are relatively new technologies that are being integrated into the grid. So you need to come up with those uh, schemes. The problem is that uh, if you were to use the traditional approach of using model-based uh, a control schemes, you might run into issues because you may not have accurate models of the distribution uh, network, right? So you are much better off uh, using some sort of data-driven approach in which uh, you assume that uh, you don't know the whole uh, model of the system uh, to, uh, to which the resources are connected. And basically what you try to do is uh, learn it uh, somehow, okay? And that's basically the premise that uh, my group has been uh, taking that uh, data-driven approach to control of distributed energy resources. So um, in, the, in, the, in the talk today, I'm going to basically uh, tell you about two problems that uh, we've been working on uh, in this space okay, of control of distributed energy resources. One of them is the problem of voltage uh, regulation, where you're trying to uh, modulate the voltage at the basis in a power distribution uh, network. Uh, to reject the disturbances uh, introduced by renewable generation and other, uh, uh, and other uh, sources of uncertainty like uh, load uh, variability and so on. And then the other problem I want to talk about is how do you do generation control in a distribution uh, network when it's operating in an landed mode and you're just uh, relying on inverter-based uh, DERs. Okay, so think about that as a, as a micro -read. In these two approach, in these two problems, um, uh, like I said, we are not going to be relying on, on a model of the system, but uh, we are going to be trying to infer such a model as uh, we go along with the, uh, with the design of the control. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the roadmap for today's uh, presentation. All right, so let's uh, start with the, with the first part. Talk about the uh, voltage regulation in distribution uh, networks. Uh, how, many, how many of you have uh, electrical background here? Okay, so do you know then what the, I think I'm gonna switch to, do you know then what the load tap changer is? So in the distribution network, the way you do voltage uh, control is uh, via these uh, load uh, tap uh, changers. Okay, so these are like uh, transformers in which you can change the, the, the turn ratio. And that's how you do voltage control, along with uh, switch capacitors um, and so on. So here, what uh, you can see is um, basically an electrical model of one of those uh, devices. So if you know a little bit about the transformer modeling, the way this is uh, just model is uh, voltage um, on the secondary side here uh, uh, is equal to the primary side divided by the square of the turn ratio. And then you have all this stuff here that is basically taking into account the, the um, is taking into account the, the resistance and reactance of the transformer plus uh, any resistance and reactance associated to the transmission line uh, that is connected in series with the transformer. So this is the model you have. And then basically, this time ratio is a change. Uh, you can change it. It typically takes uh, 33 discrete uh, values ranging from 0 0.9 to 1.1 in per unit. Okay. So this is basically the, the way you, you adjust the voltage in the distribution uh, network. You're going to change these setups. Okay, the way this uh, 
The way a current LPC control schemes uh, work are not uh, optimal in uh, many ways. Okay, so first of all, they are uh, myopic. They are just based on local voltage uh, me me measurements, and uh, they definitely don't take into account any future uncertainty effects on the current uh, control actions. Okay, so that's uh, that's a bit of a problem, and. Uh, be beyond the fact that uh, these controllers are suboptimal, the other issue is that um, you cannot uh, really rely on them for handling the, the variability associated with uh, renewable base generation or uh, new loads that are coming into the system as, as such electric uh, vehicles, because uh, these are, like I said, mechanical devices, and uh, if you operate them too often to try to uh, reject the disturbances uh, associated with these uh, sources, you're going to basically wear them out uh, really quick, right? And uh, in addition of that, you have another source of variability, which is you could be utilizing the to provide regulation services to the grid. So that adds another uh, layer of variability in the system. Okay. So, so then we, we need to, we, we want to address this issue. How do we address this uh, problem of um, LTC control schemes not being really suitable uh, uh, anymore because of the new sources that are coming online? Whether it's that uh, through a new vault park control architecture that uh, we have been designing over the years, in which uh, we rely on two types of actuators. And uh, ones that uh, uh, act on a slower time scale, and these include the LTC devices that I was talking about, switch capacitors and so on. Uh, so basically you are gonna decide uh, the, the position of those devices at these times T0, T1, T2, and then in between updates of those, what you're going to utilize is uh, inverter interface DERs with the ability to provide reactive power, uh, with the ability of the, to provide reactive power to do the fine tuning in terms of the voltage. So you're going to be utilizing this in between the time instances to do the fine uh, grain voltage control and try to uh, track the, that faster variability. Okay, so that's that. So today, uh, not, not today, in the first part of the talk, I'm going to be uh, mostly focused on the slow time scale control. And then on the second part of the talk, among other things, I'm going to be talking about how you address the, the control of this uh, inverter interface, the ERs, to, to achieve the, this uh, architecture. All right. So let me tell you a little bit about this uh, optimal LTC dispatch problem. So here's your distribution network connected to maybe some uh, external system through some tie line. <clears throat> uh, here uh, you have, uh, what you see there are the, there's one there and there's one there. Those are your LPCs, your, your regulation transformers. And uh, the problem is to find a policy for determining the position of the LTCs based on the current uh, position of the, of the taps, okay, so the, the current turn ratio, and then whatever mass voltage is you can uh, measure uh, locally, okay? So that's the idea. And then what you want to do is uh, uh, that policy uh, needs to be such that uh, you're minimizing uh, voltage uh, deviations from some reference uh, value as uh, power injections to actuate over time, okay? So that's, uh, that's the idea. So that's the, the objective uh, of the plan. So now, Let's see if we can formulate the problem uh, mathematically, all right? So first of all, we need some sort of a um, system model. I mean, I said that I was gonna not utilize models, but uh, if you want to formulate the problem, I need to tell you that there is some underlying model describing the physics of the system. Uh, and then I'll tell you, we don't have access to that model. We are gonna try to do things with data. So the model of the system is um, basically shown in this slide. So you can see, uh, that uh, we can relate the uh, squares of the voltage uh, magnitudes to the active and reactive power injections and the tap positions of the LPCs. Okay, so you, some sort of model that um, where this function G is capturing network topology and transmission line parameters. So if you are familiar with the power flow, just think of this as the power flow equations, but of course that means that uh, you would have to solve for them. But, uh, um, in an abstract sense, this function G, it exists. You can obtain it if you were able to solve the power flow and characterize uh, things analytically, but you can most of the time. Anyway, so that's uh, uh, at least conceptually the, the model. 
Now let's take some assumptions uh, here. So we're going to assume that uh, the changes in active and reactive power injections at instant K, which we denote by delta P and delta Q, are random, right? So that's uh, where uh, our randomness comes into the picture. And uh, we're going to assume that um, the, the, active, the actual active and reactive power injections P and Q, either we don't measure, we don't measure it um, or we don't know their uh, their joint probability distribution. So we don't have a whole lot of information about them. We are going to assume the network topology is known. There are good algorithms for uh, topology detection. Uh, so that's uh, that's not a big issue. And uh, But we are going to assume that the line parameters are unknown. We are talking about the distribution network, so you don't know what's out there. So there could be like um, underground cables, overhead lines, but uh, you don't have a good understanding of what the, those parameters are. So you're going to assume that um, uh, you don't know those. Okay, so because this uh, first uh, assumption uh, here, the natural way to, the natural thing to do is to formulate the problem as a Markov decision process. Anyone familiar with MDPs here? Okay, good. Okay, a few people, great. And then because these other two, this, this other three assumptions that I have here, we are gonna have to resort to reinforcement learning techniques to solve the MDP. Okay, and I'll, I'll be more, uh, specific of why that's the why that's the case all right so that's the that's the premise so if we are going to formulate the problem as some mdp i want to give you basically i'm going to give you the ingredients of the mdp so the ingredients of the mdp are the state space the state here is going to be a price of the tap ratios t and the square uh, voltage uh, magnitudes okay so that's going to be my state yeah the action space uh, are going to be the changes in the LTC tap positions, not the tap set themselves, but the changes, the delta T is here. Okay, so that's one denoting here by delta T. Those are my actions. Okay, so the change from instant K to instant K plus one. And then the reward uh, function uh, here is defined uh, uh, basically based on voltage uh, deviations from some nominal value. So Reward, uh, uh, if you are in a state A, you take action A and you transition to a state S prime, is just the voltage deviation uh, and for the new state at which uh, you land. Okay, remember that the state con contains both the tap uh, positions and the voltage. So that's how you define that uh, reward. Okay, so essentially we are penalizing voltage deviations from some reference uh, value. That's the idea. And now that we have the, the the, the ingredients of the MDP, we can go ahead and formulate it. So state transitions are going to be governed by random changes in active and reactive power injections, delta P and delta Q. Okay, remember that uh, I told you about those uh, before. So potentially, again, you can write the new state value S prime as some function of the current state, the action you take, meaning the change in the in the positions of the lab, uh, load tap changers, and then the delta P and the delta Q. So you have certain power injection active reactive power. You change that a little bit, and then you also change the, the tap positions. That's going to land you in a new state, even the previous state you were at, right? So that's the idea. And again, you know, you can think of this function H as uh, something that uh, you could uh, conceptually uh, uh, obtain using the power flow model if you were able to solve it, okay? Conceptually, potentially. All right, so the other thing that uh, you have to note uh, here is that uh, the probability of transitioning from S uh, to S prime under action A could be computed if the function H and the joint PDF of the disturbances delta P and delta Q were known, but uh, actually we assume that these were not known and also the function H is not known. So that's a... Uh, basically the, the first problem we run into here. So we don't have enough information here to, to solve the MDP uh, uh, analytically, okay, or even numerically, because we don't have the part of the model. So now what is the objective here? What we want to do is find the control policy that uh, acts, acts based on the current stage, meaning the top positions and the voltages, and tell me what to do, meaning how to change the, how to, uh, modify the the, tap, uh, the taps, okay? So that the, um, we are minimizing the discounted sum of the expected voltage, voltage deviations over time, okay? So that's what we are doing. Or, you know, if you have throw a minus there, you are basically maximizing that uh, discounted sum. I mean, I'm doing basically everything based on uh, maximization because I was talking about reward earlier, but if you 
if you define it uh, to be um, a, a cost function, then you are basically minimizing. Anyway, that's that. They are they are equivalent. So that's that's my objective uh, here. All right. So that's clear then. Okay. Let me go back once. Uh, this I did. Sorry, this computer is misbehaving a little bit. Now let's um, denote uh, by R bar the expected uh, reward for the pair, uh, um, the the pair uh, S A. So the action, the state S and the action A. So then the MVP is uh, solved if you can find um, a, fun a function Q star, which is the optimal action value function that satisfies this uh, equation and uh, this is um, some version of the Bellman equation okay so so what do you have here that's the action value for the optimal action value function for the pair s a the, the so technically um, precisely is the value of the option of, of, of the optimal action value function for those two uh, values and then what do we have here? That's the discount uh, factor. And then these are the transition probabilities of uh, going from state S to state S prime, right? And then the, the way you would get the optimal policy is by um, obtaining the argument that uh, maximizes this uh, action value function. Okay, this is a standard NDP theory. Oh, that's all great. But the problem is that uh, as I've been telling you so uh, all along, we don't know the transition probability. So we don't know this part of the model here. This we don't know, okay? Uh, and even if we knew that those transition probabilities, we could not uh, solve uh, for the optimal action value function because of the curse of dimensionality. So the state and action spaces are so large that uh, you cannot really solve uh, this in, a, in, a, in any way, in any efficient way. So what we do to address these issues is uh, we are going to uh, circumvent issue number one by applying a model free, re re model free reinforcement learning algorithm that utilizes transition samples that uh, we obtain using a virtual transition generator that uh, utilizes data that you take from the system. And then there is some clever trick to exploit that data to create new data without really relying on the model of the system, because that's always the issue, right? How do you generate that data? Oh, I can use a model of the system, but if you can use a model of the system, why are you like resorting to a model free algorithm, right? So that's a, there is a way to do that. I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. Uh, if you're interested, then um, you can read the paper that uh, where all this is written up, or we can talk at the end of the uh, of the talk. Okay, and then the other issue that um, we want to address the the fact that um, the fact that uh, the state and action spaces are too large to to solve this in any efficient uh, way. What we use is um, we're going to have some uh, learning scheme in which uh, we can do uh, uh, sequentially learn the uh, action value function, right? So that's uh, that's what we do here. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, obtaining the estimate of the action value function. So if we have Q bar, uh, sorry, Q hat denoting the approximate. Uh, uh, value the, the approximate of the approximation of the op, 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 optimal action value function. So there are a couple of ways in, in which you could get this uh, estimate. One is by using parametric functions, and the other one is neural networks, which are very trendy, very fashionable. So we actually resort to a parametric uh, uh, characterization, and uh, we just stick actually with the linear parameterization because you know this is not such a complicated uh, problem besides its size. So a linear approximation works pretty well. You don't have to throw anything fancy to it, like a neural network or, or anything. Okay. Um, and then what we are going to do is we are going to learn the the weights here, the weights uh, on this uh, linear parameterization, uh, by basically using uh, the so-called least squares policy uh, iteration uh, algorithm. Okay. So this is an algorithm that uh, all it's doing is just basically fit in the, this uh, uh, transition sample that uh, you obtain from uh, uh, measuring uh, things in the system and also from this virtual transition uh, generator. Uh, and then you fit them to, to this function and that's how you obtain the, the weights, okay? So again, you know, if you are interested in the details, you can, you can read the, the corresponding papers. Uh, okay, so that's, uh, that's how we do this. 
Now, what are some of the challenges here? This uh, least square errors policy iteration algorithm, uh, it requires uh, uh, adequate transition samples that spread all the action and uh, state, uh, spaces, okay? So how do we uh, generate those? Like I said, using this um, virtual transition uh, generator, okay, which exploits, uh, uh, as I told you uh, before, the uh, data that we have uh, obtained from the system, and then uses a clever trick to generate the more data uh, without uh, really knowing the model of the, without really utilizing the model of the system. Okay, and we want to do that because you don't want to be exploring with the actual system because that the system is uh, online in operations. If you are exploring on a real system like that, you might cause a blackout. So you don't want to do that. Okay. The other thing that uh, is problematic is that um, the LSP, the algorithm that we want to use to to obtain the the estimate, the action value function approximation also suffers from the course of dimensionality when the action space is very large, okay? So we came up with a heuristic, which is instead of trying to solve, uh, instead of trying to figure out what is the optimal policy for all the LTCs at once using this, uh, this uh, LSP algorithm, what we do is uh, we do it uh, one by one in a round robin fashion, assuming that the, others, the other LTCs are not really doing uh, anything are not uh, are not moving, and then uh, after a few rounds of that uh, round robin process, you converge to some policy. And uh, while it's suboptimal, what we have obtained uh, seen from uh, uh, simulations is that it's pretty close to what uh, you would get if you were trying to do the whole thing at once. Okay, but uh, that way we can we can scale this uh, up. All right, so let me now show you some simulation results for uh, one twenty three pass. Uh, system. So here we're going to have uh, four LTCs here, 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 and here. All right. And uh, what you see here are some simulation results uh, in which we are comparing basically the rewards, for example, here of our bunch reinforcement learning algorithm, the blue trace how that compares to the optimal solution that you would obtain using exhaustive search. For this case, you can do it because it's not a super large system. And then the actual conventional scheme, uh, the myopic scheme that I was telling you before that is only acting on, on local voltages. So you can see how obviously the batch reinforcement learning algorithm and the optimal one, the exhaustive search outperform the conventional scheme. But more interesting, I mean, that's not surprising. More interesting is that what we see here is that the batch reinforcement algorithm, okay, the, our our approach actually is very close to the exhaustive search, so it, it performs uh, very well. You could see the same thing if you plot the rewards over seven days; this uh, remain close and so on. Whereas the conventional scheme is uh, doing its uh, own thing. You can also see how much uh, variability you have on the rewards, whereas here they stay flat. And then here you have uh, basically the trajectories of the top uh, positions for all three schemes. Uh, so, so that's uh, that. These are basically the numerical uh, results for this. Any questions uh, so far? Yes, go ahead. What, what is the time scale that you're having to take these actions? So. Here we are simulating this over 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you could be, that, that depends on how fast you want to uh, do that, your, your thesis, right? But uh, you could basically dispatch them maybe every hour. And then in between hours, you could do your fine uh, tuning with the inverters. If that's not sufficient in your system because of variability, then you could shrink it maybe to half an hour. And then you do the fine tuning with other guys. Mm -hmm. It depends a little bit on your system. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't need second level. No, no, no. no. Okay, the last question. What yeah. was the simulator you used uh, to simulate this? Um, let me try to think about the, that. I think it was just custom made uh, code uh, oh, okay. in MATLAB so because cool. they're MATLAB or Python. Uh, because at some point we switched to Python. This is just a straight out uh, this flow power flow model. Mm -hmm. So that's what we are using for simulating the power system, and we coded that up. So was it wasn't like grid lab D or anything from no, here to now. No, no, we just uh, custom made it. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So you said that you generate the the, the trajectories from like your own without like an actual model. So you use you, you generate the trajectories. How do you like handle where um, a miss? Um, if the trajectory starts going off, just from my understanding, on uh, 
it can have like this like compounding effect where like it grows and grows and grows and just becomes very wrong over time. I'm, I'm trying to ask like how do you how do you make sure that the, the samples that you're generating um, is close enough that you can you can continue to work with them? You mean for uh, the 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 the, virtual, the the virtual samples that we are generating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the way it works is the is the following. Let me try to explain it without the without the math. You have samples from your system, and those samples correspond to measurements from your system. And those correspond to to delta p's and delta q's variations in your system. That's actually what's exciting your system, right? So that's the excitation you're going to have in your system, and what you want to do is generate new samples that use that excitation. You don't want to have a basically further excitation because that, that's not what you're gonna be exhibiting in your system. But what you could see is like a, a voltage is uh, going in different places because of the actions that you're taking. And that's what the virtual uh, transition generator is uh, creating essentially. I can show you the, if you want to at the end, because I mean, I, I had a couple of slides on that, but I decided to remove them because I wanted to talk more about the second okay. part. Yeah. But I can show you how it's uh, it's done if okay. you want to. Sure. It sounds good. Yeah. If there is a question in the chat, I'll read it to you. Yeah. Was PV considered during the simulation, during the oh. RCC simulation? It, it is, yes. Yes. Okay. Anything yeah. else? Yeah. Very good. Are we good? All right, so let's move on and talk about the second part. So that's the first part of the talk. Problem of voltage control on a distribution network, how do you address it uh, without having a model of your system? The second part that I'm gonna be talking uh, about, and uh, pretty excited about this part of the talk because uh, this is a relatively recent uh, result. So this is in fact the first time I'm gonna be presenting this. So we'll see how it goes. So the problem here is that uh, you have now a distribution network uh, that is uh, mostly based on inverters. Okay, so all the resources are interfaced uh, uh, via inverters. So no inertia in this distribution network. Just think of a portion of a system uh, with a bunch of uh, distributed energy resources that is uh, islanded from, uh, from the rest of the system. And what you want to do is control the system. So, which means you have to uh, control frequency, you have to control voltage at certain bases, and you may also want to control a flow of power through certain uh, transmission lines. So it's just a, a smaller system based on these inverters. So how do you generation control? That's the, that's the problem. Okay. Um, and uh, you also want to make sure that uh, whatever you are doing with uh, your control, the active and reactive power inj injections at the inverter somewhere exceed their capacity limits, right? So that's, uh, that's that. So we want to design a controller that does uh, that. So here, the controls are the reference set points, the active and reactive power set points for, for the inverters. And uh, your output, what you're going to be trying to regulate is the system frequency, voltage magnitudes at the all or a subset of the buses, and then flow of power through certain transmission lines, okay? And uh, again, conceptually, you have some sort of relation between these inputs, the set uh, points of the inverters. Um, also here, Psi is describing the, I had it in the previous slide, but this is this, this is uh, describing some uh, disturbance to the system. So it could be uncontrolled load, or it could be a PV generation that you're not controlling, whatever, but that's also affecting your, your system behavior, right? So again, you can write basically this uh, model in which the, 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 the value of the outputs at a certain instant uh, TK plus one minus uh, depend on what you did previously. And uh, here, I know that the notation is a bit uh, confusing perhaps, but uh, while the, the K index for the measurements and uh, the outputs and the K index for the use is slightly different. That's what I have here, this, uh, this um, uh, 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 what they represent. So for the inputs and the disturbances, those are uh, adjusted or measured at instance TK minus one, TK and TK plus one. And then the, the outputs here are measured at TK plus one minus, which is uh, a little bit uh, later. So this is basically, um, 
telling you how the system has evolved based on how you change the controls. Okay, so they the, the time instances here and here they don't line up, but this is what's uh, the way this is uh, written up. Okay, sounds good. All right, so now how do we solve this problem? We're going to use this idea of uh, optimization based uh, feedback. Okay, so we have some uh, optimization problem, whereas what we are trying to do is minimize the deviation of my outputs, what we are trying to regulate with respect to some reference command, subject to that model that I described uh, to you being satisfied. So whatever uh, controls that you are choosing and whatever disturbances you are measuring needs to satisfy this uh, output, the uh, input output equation, and then the capacity limits needs to be satisfied, right? And then you solve this optimization, and then you choose your control at instant k based on that solution, right? What are the issues uh, here? Okay, this controller assumes that uh, this input output uh, model here is uh, known to you, and also the capacity limits of the resources are also known to you. In practice, again, getting that model, an analytically tractable model that you can work with, it is difficult because think about what this is doing. Again, you will have to be getting some analytical. Um, expression for the solution to the power flow equation. So you don't really know this model, even if you can write it this way. That's one thing. And then these capacity limits, those uh, in practice, again, you might have uh, trouble getting them accurately characterized because they could, uh, uh, some of them could be associated with uh, uh, PD limits. Okay, so PD capacity uh, limits, and those can change over time depending on the insulation you have in your system. So, so you don't know those uh, accurately either. All right, so what do we do about uh, that then? What we're gonna be doing is formulating the problem in a slightly different way. I'm gonna take my, that input output model that I show you and linearize it. So my, this uh, delta y now is uh, basically denoting an incremental change in my uh, output. And then delta u is uh, denoting an incremental change in my uh, input. And then this uh, matrix S here relating them is just the partial derivative of the function H with respect to the control evaluated at this guy and that guy. And I mean, here there should be another term, but we are assuming that the, the, the change in the disturbances is small enough. So we drop that term here. Okay. So now let's uh, use this model to formulate any optimization. So this is the new optimization that, uh, that I'm optimizing, that I'm formulating. And here what we are trying to do is. Uh, basically, the incremental changes in your uh, in your system needs to track the incremental uh, values or that you need to track. Okay, and then uh, that's again a now subject because you are using now instead of the uh, 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 instead of um, the, the 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 control actions, the incremental control actions. What you need to make sure is that uh, the incremental changes in your control are within an incremental capacity limits, not the absolute capacity limits. And then we are adding here this uh, regularizer here to penalize uh, large uh, control deviations. So you solve this optimization, and then you set your control uh, at instant k to be whatever you had plus the solution of the optimization. It's just an incremental model at this point. Right? Now, that's all great. In theory, but in practice, you have still the same problem. If you didn't know the model H, you don't know this matrix either. I mean, okay, fine. The matrix S is slightly easier to calculate because if you have the powerful equations, you took the, you could take partial derivatives and potentially you could use the, the inverse function theorem to get that uh, uh, matrix S. It's just uh, uh, manipulating the, the sub matrices in the power flow Jacobian, so you could potentially get that. But uh, again, uh, if you don't know the, the, the model of your system, you don't know the power flow modeling uh, in detail in the first place, so you cannot get those sensitivities in the first place, right? So what we are going to do, take the same approach before and try to estimate them, okay? So we are going to utilize measurements of my output and my input to estimate this sensitivity matrix S, okay? And also, I'm going to, uh, uh, at the same time, in, uh, estimate some of the incremental capacity limits, okay, for those that I don't know about. And uh, now I'm going to use all those, um, again, those uh, estimates in the feedback optimization that, uh, that I showed you. 
And uh, this is basically a block diagram of how the whole approach works. You have your system, you take measurements, uh, and those together with the inputs that are generating those uh, measurements, you throw them at this sensitivity estimator, and then you use uh, that in the formulation of your control, which is the optimization I show you. And then the, there, there is also this block here that uh, it basically utilizes also measurements from the system to generate uh, incremental capacity limits for certain DRs, specifically the, the, uh, the PV, PV installations. Those are the ones that you typically don't know the incremental capacity limits well. So that's, uh, that's basically the, the approach. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the sensitivity estimation. Pretty straightforward. We do it uh, to regularize uh, LSC. All you are doing is basically solving this optimization here. You are just uh, trying to fit the uh, the changes in the inputs to the changes in the in the outputs uh, to show matrix S, and that's basically your sensitivity estimate. And then again, we are basically we have some regularizer uh, here in the in the optimization. Not a big deal. You can actually solve this uh, uh, problem. It's a uh, pretty straightforward. It's an LSC problem, so you, I'm sure you have done that in in some homework before. The solution to regularized problem you can write it in uh, in this uh, matrix form. And you might be wondering why is this telling us all this stuff, which is text in in, in any textbook. The reason why I want to do that is because in order to obtain the estimate of this matrix S, which is what we want to have. You need to compute the inverse of this matrix. And the inverse of this matrix, look at how it's built. It's the discounted uh, sum of this outer product of the incremental changes in the delta use. And the problem is that uh, this matrix may not be invertible if this uh, sequence here of incremental changes is not uh, persistently exciting. Okay, so if, you, if that delta U is such that uh, and the, the sequence is not persistently exciting, then this matrix is not uh, invertible. And that's a problem. Now, wait a minute. You are using now, these delta use are actually the result of that optimization that I was telling you about. So how do you fix that uh, problem? You are getting a, um, your, 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 uh, your incremental change in your controls come out of that optimization and that's how you're doing, uh, how, how you doing this estimation. So how do you fix that uh, issue, right? So the, the, the way to fix that issue is to build into the optimization some sort of a mechanism that will ensure that this uh, sequence of inputs is persistently exciting. And that's basically what I'm gonna be telling you how to, how to do. All right, so again, this is the optimization we had before, except that uh, what I did here is replace the matrix S with its estimate. Fine, all right? So if you take a, a nice approach to the problem, you could say, look, I'm just going to solve this optimization, which is uh, identical to the one that I had before with this uh, sensitivity matrix here, replaced by its estimate, and I'm going to set my control input to be this guy, right? To be the solution of the optimization, and that's it. The issue, to do the, the, the issue with doing this is that um, you might get a sequence of controls that is not persistently exciting, okay? So that's a, that's a problem, okay? So, so that's one issue. And then the other issue that uh, also uh, contributes to the sequence of inputs not being persistently exciting is that this matrix S typically has more columns than rows. So even if the sequence of inputs uh, perhaps is persistently exciting, you might not be exciting uh, the um, the, the null space of that the matrix. So again, that compounds the problem, right? So, so that's, uh, that's why you have a, that's what uh, you need to think a little bit about uh, this. So how do we fix uh, that problem? We're gonna take again the, the feedback optimization that I told you before, and I'm gonna add this term WK. This is basically identical to what I had before, but I added this WK. And this WK, is going to be zero if this sequence of uh, incremental uh, changes in what the, the, the variables that you are trying to track is persistently exciting. And otherwise, you're going to sample uh, from this uh, uh, uniform distribution. So what is this term doing? 
this time is doing the following. Let's take the the let's take the trivial case in which this matrix S is actually a square matrix. Okay, so this matrix S is a square matrix by adding this uh, random perturbation here, which ensures that uh, this uh, whole thing is persistently exciting. The solution is just basically uh, the, the, your control is going to be the inverse of this matrix times that guy. Okay, this is a trivial uh, uh, case. But because this uh, sequence is persistently exciting and this matrix S is full run, you get a, a sequence of controls that is persistently exciting and then you can do your estimation. So that's basically the reason why you want to have that. However, if the matrix S is fat, has more columns than rows, by doing this, you might also be, you might only be uh, getting excitation on the part of the control uh, that is in the subspace that is orthogonal to the null space of the of the matrix S. So this matrix S, if you have more columns than rows, it has a null space. And by taking this approach, you are only getting persistently excitation on the part that is uh, spanning the, the row space, but not the null space of that matrix. Okay, so that's a problem. So how do you fix that? The way to fix that. The way to fix that. Uh, the way to fix that is, uh, is very straightforward. You solve the optimization as before, and then you look at the you look at the sequence of uh, controls. Actually, this should be delta, you know, delta where start. So if the sequence of controls is persistently exciting, then you don't do anything. But if the sequence of controls is not persistently exciting. You are going to add this term here, and this term here is just a, is just basically a vector that uh, you are taking a, at random from the in the null space of that matrix and multiplying by some constant that uh, that you also take at random. So you are adding this this term here whenever the sequence of controls is not persistently exciting to make sure that uh, you are exciting that the uh, component of the of the of the input, okay, that part of the input. Okay, so that's uh, that's that. So the combined effect of this uh, W in the cost function and this uh, term in the null space of the matrix S that gives you a mechanism to to to, to get enough ex uh, excitation to do your estimation, right? That's that. Okay, so there are a couple of slides uh, here that tell you hey, what happens if uh, when you add this term here. Remember that if you solve this optimization uh, here, you are solving it. Uh, uh, when you solve the optimization, you might get a solution that uh, is actually hitting one of these limits. So if you are trying to add this term, you might be violating the capacity limits. So the way to address that is to add in these terms here in the capacity constraints that you choose them at random. So you are basically shrinking the feasibility region of the optimization a little bit, just a little bit. So you get uh, you get uh, some new way to add that uh, orthogonal term, and then the last thing that I wanted to to tell you is, well, what about the capacity limits? I told you that uh, for PD installations, uh, those capacity limits might change because this is a typical PD care for a PD installation, but this uh, maximum here depends on the amount of insulation you have. So if insulation is lower. This might be lower, right? So if this is the current set point for the for the, the current output, then you might get a less incremental capacity. So you want to make sure that you are capturing that uh, viability by estimating this curve, and that's what that uh, other block that I have in the in the block diagram I showed you earlier uh, does. Okay. So anyway, I don't want to bother you with the details on that uh, on this part. All right. So. So that's uh, that's that. The other thing that uh, we also did uh, here that I don't want to bug you with the details uh, either is that uh, we also have model the residuals in the in the in the linear model that we used to predict uh, what the outputs are doing based on those sensitivity estimates, and uh, that the residual uh, modeling we can incorporate it also in the optimization uh, to make sure that. Uh, uh, if the sensitivity estimate is uh, uh, performing uh, poorly, you are not taking control actions that are unsafe. Okay, again, those, those details 
part of here and uh, 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 at the end of the day what you get is uh, some sort of um, some sort of uh, uh, constraints that are capturing all that anyway that's uh, all the uh, lot of features that uh, that I'm going to bother you with so what I want to show you now uh, is how this uh, approach uh, works so here is a 13 bus uh, system with uh, five uh, Inverter interface resources. So at buses two, three, and six, we have what we have, what we call grid forming inverters, and then at buses one and eight, we have a grid following inverters. So you can think of this as the PV uh, as buses with PV installation. Okay, and those are the objectives. You are trying to regulate frequency to sixty hertz and, and regulate voltage uh, at uh, certain buses. So here are um, how we generated the the, the data. For the for the PV genera generating uh, resources at buses one and eight, we took some uh, data from uh, Enrel Swahu Solar Measurement Grid. Oh, that's the that's the data, and then we use this to estimate the the, the maximum uh, solar power that is available, and also the estimate that you would get based on the on the on the on the approach that we have to that estimation, right? And then this is the data that uh, we are using in the simulation. So what you are seeing here is how the system uh, reacts uh, after you have a load perturbation. So you are, we are perturbing loads every four seconds. And here we are executing the controller every one second. So you see, for example, here what happens with frequency. After you perturb the load, let's say at, uh, at T0, that's where your frequency lands. And then as you start taking uh, control actions, you see how you bring the C frequency back. So then you, each of these blue dots are uh, perturbations in the load that are causing frequency. And then this, you see how the controller reacts to that. You, you see the same thing here with voltages. So you see that um, this uh, approach uh, works uh, pretty, pretty well okay, to, do, to, to control voltage and frequency in this system. And that's pretty much uh, it in terms of what I wanted to tell you uh, about. So here are some uh, concluding remarks about the, the talk. So uh, I basically told you how to address a couple of uh, problems uh, uh, when you have power systems with, uh, with the deep penetration of the ERs. So one of them is voltage control. One is, the other one is uh, a generation control. Uh, and then both of them, uh, we assume no prior information or very little information about the underlying model of the of the system. So we are mostly relying on measurements to do a control. Uh, and if you want to know more, more about the details of these works, you can read these two papers, which you can find on my website. Uh, so no, just uh, Google me and then, then you'll find them. So this is the one where we talk about voltage control, and then this is the more recent one on the second part of the talk that I was telling you about. So that's all that's all I have uh, for today. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. So I actually have a few questions. The first one is on the, the second part of your talk. Is yep. that something that would need closer to real time controls or something that happens at the 30 minute per hour? No, no, yeah, ah. you're executing every one second. Okay. So think about this as a replacement for a secondary control in a power system. So the ADC type control that you're executing every two to four seconds. That would be equivalent to this, but instead of relying on a model to do the, the, the design of the controller, you're just relying on this uh, uh, feedback online optimization idea. And these controls, they, these are going to be distributed devices that are integrated? That, that's a very good question. So in theory, that uh, optimization that I show you, uh, you have to solve it uh, in a centralized location, right? Mm -hmm. Which is not that different from what you would do in a bug system. In practice, a lot of the work that my group does, which uh, I have not talked about this at all today, is how to distribute those computations, distributed optimization and control. So a lot of these uh, optimization problems that um, appear in these uh, in these settings, uh, we have ways to solve them in a distributed fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you do that, then you can just uh, have uh, computing devices attached to each of the resources, they exchange mm -hmm. information. And that's how they do it. So if you want to know more about what we do, Luis is the guy to talk to because he works in our lab doing that stuff. So he knows that stuff pretty well. And the second question was, I mean, this, this is very exciting work. Is there any um, 
I'm sure there's effort, but is are you working with any utilities to get pilots deployed? No, not yet. Not yet. Not the not the not there yet. I mean, this is uh, pretty pretty fresh. But uh, I I mean, I would love to at least um, if we could get the data from some uh, utilities uh, to test the algorithms offline, that would be that would be great. Mm -hmm. But uh, but no, we have not uh, talked to anyone yet about it. Yes, please. Um, so you mentioned the relationship between the sensitivity uh, estimator and the, um, the input control. So, um, and how do you solve them independently? Do you use like generating <laughs> data for the input to get the estimator and then use that estimator in practice? No, that, that's the thing, right? That you're doing it all at once. Right. So you use the, so, so that's the, that's the, that's the trick here, right? That uh, you are using, Output data from your system <coughs> together with the control you're applying to obtain this the sensitivity estimate. But then the controller, that's the one that is generating that data. So these two problems are coupled. So that's why you need all those built in mechanisms to make sure that um, you're slightly perturbing the inputs so that the sensitivity estimation still works. So they are really coupled. It's not that uh, I'm going to solve my. Solve my, my my control problem for a while, uh, uh, assuming I know the matrix, and then I use that uh, to, 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 to do a new estimate of the matrix. No, they are really tough. Like this time instant, you are basically doing both. <coughs> that makes sense? Yeah. All right, I have a quick question. Yes. In your fast scale optimization, does it depend on the time of day and the scale you have to choose? Because during the time you may have a lot of EVs and now you have a lot of EV charging. So that, that requires updating uh, more frequently or less frequently. Oh, that's an excellent point. And uh, now that you mentioned it, that makes a lot of sense that uh, this rate, in this case, we are executing the control every second, mm -hmm. but you are seeing at night, you yeah. could actually execute it in a much lower time scale. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and actually, we don't know until we see some new. Things. Exactly. My guess is that, um, and that that's, a, that's a good question in the sense that um, maybe there is some way. In, which is not including the optimization, of course, but uh, basically it tells you how to adjust your update rate on your controller. So a mechanism that is tracking the variability of the of the of the things that you are trying to control, perhaps, and it's basically adjusting the. Yeah, and I rate. if you don't do it fast enough, you get more variability. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I, the, the, I mean, I need to look into that literature of uh, time trigger mm -hmm. control, but I think there might be. Some ideas there, right? But uh, basically, tells you how 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 to change the rate of your of your controller. It was very exciting to have you all to be in person. So that was that was great. Thank you.